Let's uh, have a warm round of applause for Mrs. Roshni Mastani. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for that. You know, he's amped me up so much that I'm so scared of now disappointing you all. So thanks, but no thanks for that, Jersey. Um, so yes, hi, uh, my name's Roshni, and I'm the CEO and founder of The Asian Parent. And if you don't have kids, you will have no idea about my product. And if you do have kids and you don't know about me and my product, then shame on me. Uh, but it's really great to be here and to be part of the Antler community and to just, you know, be here to support all of the startups as they do their demo day because this is such a big thing. Uh, this is like the unveiling and I'm so excited and stoked to hear them. But, you know, because I've been in the startup ecosystem for quite a while now, I feel like the older sister, the Che Che. And I feel like there are some wisdoms that I've learned across the last few years that I really want to share with the startups. Um, and these are things that I wish when I started my company a few years ago, someone had sat me down and said, Roshni, be prepared for battle because it really is a battle. Um, and today I'm so excited and so stoked to be able to scare them because I wish, you know, at least if, if I had to go through and I've got all these battle scars, then I, I'm glad to be able to pass my wisdom to someone else. Oops. Okay, so here are some nine lessons I've learned about uh, running a business in Southeast Asia. But first, you know, because I'm a startup founder, so it's always be closing, sell yourself. So <laughs> bear with me while I have to do the 60 seconds infomercial and you have no choice but to sit in through it. So yay. <laughs> uh, but I run the largest parenting platform in Southeast Asia. It's a website, it's an app, it's a community. And here's my QR code to download it. And if I've done such a great job, you're gonna give me a five-star review, right? Yes. Okay, so a little bit about the community. We have 30 million users monthly, which are mostly mom. 95% moms, 5% dads. Um, and we are content community and commerce. We also produce our own mom and baby products, things like stretch mark creams uh, and baby wash and stuff like that for the moms. So um, we've got, we're in 12 markets. So pretty much all the markets in Southeast Asia and a few others like Sri Lanka, India, etc. cetera. Um, in, out of the 12 markets, in eight of the markets, we're the number one parenting platform. We also have about 250 employees across the different markets. Headquarter for us is Singapore, but our biggest market is Indonesia, where we have about 80 to 100 people. Um, our investors include Fosun. Fosun is a really big Chinese company. They are also the owners behind ClubMed. Uh, we have Vertex Ventures, uh, which is Singapore, and we're part of the uh, fully Tamasic-funded uh, uh, portfolio company. Uh, we also have JD.com, one of China's largest e-commerce companies and logistics providers. We have Mirai Asset, one of the uh, largest asset management companies from Korea, as well as Naver from Korea, which is a social network plus basically the internet in South Korea. Uh, they also own nine messaging apps. So that's why I'm standing here today, uh, just so I can share with you all <clears throat> about Southeast Asia. So now everyone who's doing business here or working here, I'm sure you all know these demographics, right? I don't have to share it with you that Southeast Asia, <coughs> sorry, I've got a slight cough. Southeast Asia is not one market. We call ourselves one market because it's convenient. If we put ourselves all together, we suddenly seem huge. We're about two thirds the size of China. And so we can say, hey, legitimately, we, we, you know, we're big. Don't ignore us, come give us money. Uh, but the reality on the ground is each Southeast Asian countries are so different from each other. If you even look at the top six economies or the top six markets in Southeast Asia, which everyone goes after. So the first one would be Singapore, right? Singapore as a population is so small, six million people. And then we compare it to Indonesia with around 270 million people. Um, and then we've got different currencies across the six markets. You know, you've got the Singapore dollars, the Thai baht, all pegged to different types of economies and currencies as well. Uh, we've got corporate tax rates anywhere from 17% up to like 35% in the Philippines. So if you're going to headquarter a company, please do it in Singapore. We've got the best tax rates. Uh, also, ease of doing business index in Singapore. It's ranked number two in the world. And then if you compare it again, unfortunately, to Philippines, it's 124. Internet penetration goes anywhere from 40% up to 90%. Uh, GDP per capita anywhere from 2,500 to over 65,000. So there's none of these countries, none of them are similar in any aspects. Even in terms of languages, each country speaks a different language. In terms of religion, most of these countries have different religions that they practice as well. So there's almost nothing similar across Southeast Asia. But there is something. We're more similar in culture than it seems. And what does that mean? 
In Southeast Asia, one of the things that brings us together is relationships. Knowing people, who you know. So that's why, you know, if you go and meet people, they'll say, hey, where you went to school? Ah? You're a Hua Chong boy. Ah. Wow. Oh, where did, who's your parents? Ah? What's your last name? Which community, which town did you come from? So relationships really matter in Southeast Asia. And that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing because if you spend time building relationships with the right people, it means that people are going to give you an opportunity to sell your company and do business with them, even though you have no track record, which is great for startups. Um, so who you know really, really matters. And that does, so for a lot of founders here, we shouldn't be behind the screens just on our uh, computer, just typing out emails and, and coding projects. We really need to be out there networking with people, meeting with people. But even more than that, we should not be hanging out with other startups and other VCs and investors. Because if you've built a good business, the VCs are going to come find you. The startups, yes, they're, they're our comfort zone to go and you know, go to Timber and Kopio with another startup founder. But that's not what we should be doing. We should be out there with our customers, with our clients, with our users, really getting to know them, getting out of the comfort zone and spending all of our time really understanding our own product and building our own business and building relationships with our uh, partners and other stakeholders in the industry. The other thing that really brings us, now that's the pros, right? But the bad part about Southeast Asia is the bureaucracy, the red tape. You know, it takes about eight to nine months sometimes to register a business in any of the Southeast Asian markets. It's not like Singapore, you know, where in one day you can register a business and in two hours you can get the OCBC person to come to your office and, uh, and you know, open up a bank account for you. This is not going to fly in Indonesia. It's not going to fly in the Philippines. Some of these markets can take eight months to a year. You might even need things like a social media license. You might need things like, uh, you know, um, a license to employ people. You, even if you want to let go of people, you have to suddenly go through six months of like different types of things like inquisitions and you know warning letters before you can even let go of a bad hire. So, so that's one of the negative things about being in Southeast Asia. And of course, we have archaic laws. Um, and that's a big problem for startups when we're trying to disrupt. The second point is that <clears throat> oh, my image didn't load. Darn. OK. So there's no such thing as playing by, the, uh, playing by the book in Southeast Asia. So the image, if you had seen it, was Fifty Shades of Grey. But it was a little boy <laughs> looking at different colors of grey. OK, because that's what, ah, great. So, so because that's what operating a business in Southeast Asia is like, right? There's a lot of gray zones. You're going to be disrupting a lot of old industries and businesses. Now, most of Southeast Asia's economies are run by big businesses, old families uh, who have been around for, you know, the last 50 years, 100 years building up their businesses. They're not going to like you because you're coming in to eat my pie. So I'm going to try to get rid of you as soon as possible. And what am I going to do? I'm going to try to lobby different types of legislations. I'm going to try to maybe change the laws. I'm going to come after you to try to shut you down. But the good thing is that if you're a startup, it means that you've got nothing to lose. So come lah, come sue me. Send me legal letters. It's OK. So don't be scared if you suddenly have people coming into your office and they're like, hey, is your company really registered or not? You know, how many employees do you have? Can I see their contracts? Are they on full-term contracts or are they on part-time contracts? Don't worry about all those things, okay? Don't let anyone scare you about it, okay? Because at the end of the day, what you need to show in the first one year is product market fit. So it doesn't matter if you're breaking all the rules. And, you know, these companies that go after you have even more to lose than you. But you need to be prepared for it. You need to know that this is what's going to happen. And so don't be kanchong and don't be scared when it does happen. You also need to empower your people to think out of the box. So if you run a business in Southeast Asia or anywhere in Asia, you know that we grow up and in school, the teachers will tell you, hey, keep quiet. Ah. Don't make so much trouble. If you make trouble, I will kick you out of the class. Okay? You want to talk, you put up your hand. You say, excuse me, mister, can I ask a question or not? If the teacher says no, no choice. Okay? So this is Southeast Asia for you. And we have to hire these people. So how are we going to build a business? Because we're trying to say, we need a business to disrupt. We need you to question things. We need you not to follow by the rules. Sounds impossible, right? So one of the problems as well in Southeast Asia is that we're so used to getting A's. So if we don't, do a, if we don't get an A, we're in trouble, which means we better play it safe because we need to memorize, give rote answers, and get our A. Don't ask too many questions. So that's 
a big issue and challenge. So you have to empower your people to know that it's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to get an F. Just deal with it. So what do we do? What we do is we hire people and we let them sink or swim. Throw them into the deep end. If they end up swimming, fantastic. They're the kind of people you need for a startup. But if they sink, too bad. It, you, 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 just, you just have to sometimes be brutal. What we also do as a company is we give fuck-up cards. So every employee, the moment they join us, every six months get two fuck-up cards. What it does is it allows people to make mistakes. Because you, it's like a get-out-of-jail uh, free card. If you make a mistake, it's okay. You're not going to get fired. And the reason that we give two fuck-up cards and not one is because Southeast Asians again go, wow, if I use my fuck-up card, then how? Better not. So we'll still not make a mistake. I got two, so it's okay. Can use one, save one. So, so that's the reason that we have fuck-up cards. Also, don't overlook the importance of good culture. You know, we spend a lot of time, as a startup, looking for product market fit. We spend a lot of time fundraising. That's the most important job for a CEO, right? Making sure that your company doesn't run out of money. You also spend a lot of time talking to customers, trying to get revenue, especially now, right? In the post-WeWork uh, days, we're all trying to be EBITDA positive companies. But while you're spending all of your time building your company, you have to remember it's not all about brains. It's also about heart which means that you have to constantly remind your people about your mission and vision. It's not just about you knowing your mission and vision. It's so important that every single person in your organization is able to say the same mission and the same vision statement. You also need to talk about core values and ethics. So as a company, we believe in non-judgmental, which means that if someone is judgmental to someone else, for example, if someone doesn't want to hire someone based on race or age or gender or sexual orientation, we need to let go of these people because they're the, not the right value for our company. And you also have to set expectations and goals and talk to people about their OKRs and really sit there and make sure everyone's hitting their KPI and OKRs. The fifth thing I've learned, once you expand to at least, so when is the right time to actually start caring about HR, processes, operations, audits, uh, you know, proper legal contracts, etc. I believe it's when you have at least 50 employees. Below 50 employees don't care. Contract just right in the back of a piece of napkin. It's okay. Uh, but after 50 employees, that's when it's really, really important to spend all of your time, energy, make sure that you hire consultants and come up with very, very good employee contracts, come up with very good ESOP policies. Also make sure that your businesses are registered across all the different countries, your audit cycles, care about your finances, etc. This is also important if you have more than two countries at any point in time. The number six thing, this is actually really important. So now we're moving on to product, right? So this is the example of what our website is. That part that's circled in red, does everyone know what this is? Everyone? Nas, do you know what this is? This is the menu bar, woohoo! Great job. Now you're gonna be shocked to know that 65% of our users who are moms across Southeast Asia, so you're talking about 65% of 30 million users had no idea that was the menu bar because they're so used to the super app concept, which means that your menu is right there in the front of your website or your app. It's all on the home page. Look at Grab, look at Gojek, look at Carousel, look at JD, look at Ali, look at Lazada. Everyone's menu is not hidden in a menu bar. Everyone's menu is right in the front of the home page. And this is something that we only realized after like six years of operations. So shame on me. So the fact is that, you know, it's really important to not take your design sensibilities, your UI uh, practices from Medium or any other Western countries. It's really important if you're doing business in Southeast Asia to understand that Southeast Asia operates much more similarly to China. So if you have to take design inspiration, take it from China, don't take it from San Francisco. The same way for, there's a reason, right, why in, in every market in Southeast Asia, you see a chat app that's really popular. In Vietnam, it's Zalo. In Philippines, it's Viber. In uh, Thailand, it's Line. So it's not WhatsApp. And the reason is because each one of these apps are very WeChat-like. They are all super apps. The same way for Grab versus Uber, right? Or Gojek versus Uber. You're allowed to be able to basically hire your massage service on the go. So we really need to be taking design references from China. Seventh thing, local languages really, really matter. 
So you'll notice that we started up Malaysia 2014, 2015, and we had almost no traction in Malaysia at all. Suddenly, in the middle of 2016, we did one critical change. We moved away from English, and we did everything in Bahasa Malay. And ever since then, without spending anything on marketing, our traffic just grew exponentially. And we've tried this in multiple countries. In Nigeria, instead of doing English, we did Swahili. In Sri Lanka, we did Sinhalese. And every time we go into a local market and we use their local languages, and not just the main language of a country. So in Philippines, it's not about going in Tagalog and Filipino. It's about going in Bis Bisaya, it's about going in Cebuan, etc. So you have to go hyper-local in each market. So yeah, that was, for, that was my moment of, again, my shock tank moment, going, what? How did I know, not know this? My second last point, it's about the founder's mindset. This is something that's really, really critical, and nobody talks about this in Southeast Asia. Everyone thinks that, oh my god, I can IPO this company within five years. I can have an exit in the next three years, five years, someone big is going to come and buy me up. The reality of the fact is that it takes somewhere between 10 to 20 years to get an exit in Southeast Asia. For most companies, most tech startups, you need to be ready to be working on your company for the next 15 years. If you're not willing to give 10 to 15 years of your life to this, please do not start the company. Okay? Because the fact is that you get founders who burn out after two, three years. And the reason is because they think that it's going to take them five years. And after two, three years, they realize, hey, I don't even have product market fit yet. So some of the biggest companies, right, Carousel, Gojek, Grab, uh, Property Guru, Razor, etc., they took a very, very long time to reach where they are. They're a lot older than we give them credit for. I'm a lot older than most people think. Okay, so it takes a really long time to build a company in Southeast Asia. And that's why the 996 work culture of China does not work for Southeast Asia. Because we are not sprinting, we are on a marathon. So you cannot burn out. You need to, be, you need to have work-life balance. Which means that in that 15 years that it takes you to exit a company, you're going to get married, you're going to get divorced maybe. You're going to get pregnant, you're going to have uh, maybe a miscarriage and multiple miscarriages. God only knows what, but life catches up with you. Your parents are going to fall sick. These are all realities that we have to deal with in that 15 years. So it takes three times more effort to build a successful company in Southeast Asia than China. My last point uh, is, again, it's not about all brains. A lot of it is about heart. Companies that rally your troops because you have a purpose, a mission, a vision, and you articulate that well, do a lot better than companies that do not. This is a study by Ernst & Young, which says that in the last three years, 58% of companies that prioritize purpose achieved 10% or more revenue growth over three years. Companies that prioritize purpose and a cause do much better, generally speaking, than anyone else. It's it matters to your customers, it matters to your employees, and it also really matters to your profit. So for us at The Asian Parent, our cause for 2020, it's a very big cause, it's a very daunting cause. We've taken up the vision and we've decided, and we've put it out there, and I'm sharing it with all of you here, that our cause is to, is to reduce stillbirth rates by 10% across all the markets in Southeast Asia. Stillbirth is when a baby dies during pregnancy, close to near to full term. In Southeast Asia, we have more than 100,000 babies that die every year. 30% of these deaths could have been prevented. We've taken on the goal that we're personally responsible to reduce this by 10%. And I can't think of something more meaningful for my team. We wake up every single day knowing that today we have to give our all in the company because it's no longer about our pool. It's no longer about CAC. LTV, EBITDA, it's about saving lives. And this matters to us. So that's what gives us the purpose, the vision, the energy to keep going on and doing it every single day. So that's my purpose, that's my cause. My question to you is, what's yours? Thank you. Hmm.